Every Sunday, we Catholics go to church, and we profess our faith using a version of the ancient Nicene Creed. And we explain, together as a whole congregation, that the entire reason Jesus Christ became man, the whole point of the gospel is what? For us men and for our salvation. Why was Jesus born at Christmas? For our salvation. Why did Jesus die on Good Friday? For our salvation. Why did he rise again on Easter Sunday? It was for our salvation. Salvation is central to the story of the Bible. All of the events in sacred scripture are ordered towards our salvation. But if you were to leave Mass, right after saying those words from the creed and went into the parish hall for the eighth sacrament of coffee and donuts. <laughs> and there you found somebody in the parish hall talking about how he's been saved and talking about his salvation. I suspect a lot of Catholics would wonder if that guy wasn't really a non-Catholic Christian who was just visiting the parish. Because we Catholics, although we affirm the importance of salvation in the creed, don't talk much about salvation. When I told a friend of mine that I was writing a new book on salvation, he said to me, why don't you just call it How to Get to Heaven? And that's a pretty common way Catholics speak. We tend not to speak of being saved, we tend not to speak of salvation, and we substitute other terms like getting to heaven. But salvation is key. We can't just talk around it. In fact, it's so important. Salvation is really what Jesus' name is all about. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the very first chapter of the New Testament, an angel appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him that he is to be the foster father, in effect, of the Messiah. And he says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. His name will be called Jesus because Jesus comes from the Hebrew, Yehoshua or Joshua, which literally means the Lord saves, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church explains in paragraph 430. Jesus' name sums up the whole story of the Bible, the Lord saves. Salvation is central to our faith. We refer to Jesus as our Savior. But what does it mean to be saved? I remember being a teenager on a family vacation when I was posed a question that I felt like came out of left field. I was at a hotel with my family and talking to a group of kids and one of the kids said to me, are you saved? Have you been saved? I think I look like a deer caught in the headlights. What a strange question I asked myself. And the conversation kept going into other areas. And so I could tell that there was one kid who was really concerned about my salvation and my answer to this question. The others weren't really interested in my response. So the conversation went off in a different direction for a moment. And I could tell that 
that Katie would ask me that question, was it gonna let it go? So I had a little bit of time to think to myself and I thought, what a strange question, am I saved? Well, well, that, that's getting out of hell, right? I, I won't go to hell, I'll go to heaven. But he's asking me if I've already been saved. That's a strange thing to ask. Isn't being saved going to heaven? I thought as a devout Catholic teenager. Moreover, I gotta admit, I was a little offended. Am I saved? Is he really serious? There's a question, I might go to hell? I'm a good guy, I go to church on Sunday with my family. I, you know, don't break curfew. I don't break the rules. Why is he, why is he asking me if, you know, I'm going to hell? I remember I was sort of, you know, confused. And he put the question to me again after there was a lull in the conversation. And I remember my response. Well, of course I'm saved, right? And he was happy with my answer and we moved on. But I wasn't happy with my answer. I remember I thought about that on our way home from that family vacation. And I continued to think about it for many years. And I guess this Lexio is sort of the, the fruit of thinking about it for all of these years. What does it mean to be saved? It really is the heart of the gospel, salvation. And yet as Catholics, we don't think about it very often or we don't talk about it very often. If you think salvation is just a future reality, as we're going to see, you're actually sort of minimizing the meaning of salvation in Scripture. Because for the New Testament authors, salvation isn't just something that's going to happen in the long distant future. It has implications for our life right now. And one of the things that I've learned is if you misunderstand salvation, you can set yourself up for some very dangerous spiritual pitfalls. So what are we going to do here? Well, I want to look at that question, what does it mean to be saved, by first looking at the Bible and looking at the teaching in particular of the New Testament. Now, to be honest, there are lots of different ways God saves his people in Scripture, and we can't look at all of them. I want to look in particular on what it means to experience salvation in Christ in the New Testament. Why start with scripture? Well, the Second Vatican Council explains, for the sacred scriptures contain the word of God. And since they are inspired, really are the word of God. And so the study of the sacred page is, as it were, the soul of sacred theology. If you want to know Catholic theology, you've got to pay close attention to sacred scripture. So I want to really base our study here on the primary theologians of the church, Matthew, Mark, Paul, John, and so on and so forth. At the same time, I want to make sure that we're reading scripture in a way that is mindful of the church's rich tradition. And uh, there's a great quote from G.K. Chesterton that explains what tradition is really all about. He says, tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, our ancestors. It is the democracy of the dead. Tradition refuses to submit to the small and arrogant oligarchy of those who merely happen to be walking about. Democracy tells us not to neglect a good man's opinion. Tradition asks us not to neglect the good man's opinion, even if he is our father. So what I want to do is make sure that we're not just reading scripture in a way that is isolated from the experience of 2,000 years of Christian faith and wisdom. And that Christian faith and wisdom that's been passed down through the ages is beautifully brought together and summarized in what we call the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I'll just be referring to it as the Catechism here. So I wanna draw from the riches that we find there. And as I said, I wanna look at various misconceptions of salvation. Remember Jesus at Caesarea Philippi asks the disciples, who do men say that I am? Sort of takes a poll. And then after he receives the answer, what other people have been saying, which he shows isn't fully complete, he says, 
but who do you say that I am? Jesus is the greatest teacher in all of history. So what he does is he starts with the misconceptions, which help us clarify our understanding. Likewise here, I want to start with misconceptions, really common, and show how if you get your understanding of salvation wrong, you set yourself up for some very dangerous uh, errors and tendencies in the spiritual life. Theology is ultimately pastoral, or at least it should be. Right? If you have pastoral problems, if you have problems in ministry, if you have problems explaining the faith to others uh, and people aren't hearing you, you're going to have problems with the Christian life, with discipleship. Right? So I want to look at how getting the teaching right has huge implications for the way we live our Christian life. They're not just abstract ideas. Catholic theology isn't like Catholic trivia. Right? Just get some of the details right and, uh, you know, it's really about getting your facts in line and, you know, then you know the truth. Well, it's not just enough to live the truth. You've got to know the truth. You know the truth so that you can live the truth. All right. All right. So, number one, the first misconception I want to begin with, self-help. Salvation as self-help. Go into any bookstore today. And you will find an aisle, maybe two, dedicated to a recently new genre that is growing rapidly in popularity. Self-improvement. Self-help. Now, you won't find the Bible on this aisle in the bookstore. And for good reason. Right? Because the Bible tells us that salvation is anything but self-help. Salvation is not something that we can earn on our own power. Salvation is not something that we can just figure out on our own. Salvation is not just about becoming a better you. St. Paul says we have to die to ourselves and rise to new life. And he always links that idea of new life to a key concept Grace. Now, as soon as I say the word, I get hungry. Grace. What is grace? Well, it's a lot more than a prayer before meals, right? What exactly is grace? We sing about it. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Why is grace so amazing? Well, let's look at this word. We can begin by examining the letter to the Ephesians. There we read, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. Now that word grace is central to Pauline theology. There is an Anglican New Testament scholar who's been doing groundbreaking work in this area. He wrote a book here called Paul and the Gift. It's probably the most important book in, written in Pauline studies in the last 30 years. And what he does is he examines this key idea of grace. I've already talked about the fact that Catholics don't talk much about salvation. And, you know, as a Catholic growing up, as a cradle Catholic, there were lots of terms I heard a lot and used a lot and never thought much about growing up. Until I was much older. Think about it. We celebrate the Mass. But if you ask me, the Mass, what is that? Why do we call it Mass? That doesn't sound like something I want to celebrate. It sounds like something I want surgically removed from my body. <laughs> Why do we call it Mass? We, we use that term all the time, but without really thinking about it. It comes from the Latin, by the way, Misa, which is where we get the word mission. The Mass is what sends us out on our mission. Hosanna. There's another term we use every Sunday. When I was a college professor, uh, I taught a course that all the undergraduates had to take in Catholic theology. And one of uh, the things that I looked forward to every time I taught the course, I knew it would happen. I could count on it. It was like clockwork. 
before the first session, a student would come up to me and say, Dr. Barber, I've been Catholic my whole life. I, I grew up in a Catholic household. I go to church every Sunday. I, I don't really think I need to take this class. And I would say, all right, well, would you like to try to test out of it? Oh, yes, definitely. All right, here we go. Right now? Yeah, three questions. You ready? Okay, first question. Why do we say Hosanna at Mass? What does the word mean, Hosanna? They look at me and they say, um, I said, you, I, I, I remind them before they gave the answer, you say it every Sunday. Surely you know what it means, Hosanna, in the highest. Praise, it means praise. No, it doesn't mean praise. Oh. So, salvation is actually the meaning of the word Hosanna. We say it every Sunday. Save us in the highest. Well, what's the next question? Then I'd ask them, why do we call it Mass? I never had to ask the third question. <laughs> never once. People always say, well, what would be the third question? I don't know. I never had to come up with one. <laughs> right? What is the idea of grace in the New Testament? Well, Barclay in his work shows that the Greek term that Paul uses, that's translated in English grace, charis, was a pretty common term in Greek literature. It wasn't even a religious term. It's used by Greek writers who are referring to just everyday interactions with people. What does the word grace mean? Charis? It meant gift. When Paul's readers heard his letters proclaimed and found him speaking of the grace of God, they knew what he was referring to. He was referring to the gift of God. And I really like this passage here in Ephesians because you can see how it actually draws this out. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. There it is. Grace is a gift. And Barclay goes into ancient Roman culture, Greco-Roman culture, and shows that gift giving was an essential part of that society. Your relationships with other people were defined by gift giving. So the wealthy were understood to have a obligation, a responsibility to the larger civic society to reach out to those who were in a lower economic position and bestow on them gifts for what purpose? So that they could reciprocate. So you gave a gift to someone so that they could enter into a relationship by completing a circle of giving. Now, when you're giving to people who are less fortunate than you are, that can get delicate. And so Barclay shows that in the ancient world, they would often enter into very delicate conversations before they even gave a gift to someone about what the response to the gift would be so that nobody would be ashamed, no one would be embarrassed, right? But the point was to kind of play a game of catch, right? Gift giving was like a game of catch. Barclay says, the goal was to keep the ball, the gift, continually circulating back and forth. And one key aspect of this was the wealthy had to make sure that they found worthy recipients. People who could respond and people who would respond. They wouldn't just take a gift and disappear. Because it was such an important part of civic life, it was understood to be the responsibility of the giver to identify people of integrity who could receive the gift. Uh, Pseudo Facilities writes that giving to the unworthy is like sowing seeds in the sea. Now what's amazing is when you read Paul in light of this context, his teachings really come alive. Right? Paul writes, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. What is the gift? What is the grace? The 
God's grace isn't like, you know, some super stuff that, you know, you get injected into you and now you have superpowers. No, grace isn't just stuff. Grace is a person. The gift of God is the gift par excellence. It's the gift of Jesus Christ. The gift is the giver. God gives us his son and this gift is made manifest for us on the cross. Where Christ gives himself to what end? Well, the gift doesn't end on the cross. Christ continually gives himself to the believer. He gives himself to us so that he can dwell in us. We read, Paul goes on to say, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What is grace? It's Christ living in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And there it is who loved me and gave himself for me. So what is grace? Grace is the gift of the Son who gave himself on the cross, but his gift doesn't end there. He dwells within us for what purpose? So that I can now live a new life, so that I can be conformed to the giver. I can become like the giver. So it's the gift, you can say, that keeps on giving right? Christ gives himself to us so that we can be united to him and become givers ourselves. The amazing thing, though, about Paul's teaching is this. Grace is not given to those God who has carefully vetted out. God is giving the gift to everyone. Grace is given to the unworthy, and for Paul's ancient readers, this would have been remarkably countercultural. Paul writes, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Why, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. How are we saved? We are saved because God gives us his gift. This is so important for us as Catholics to remember. God gives his gift to the unworthy. I remember when I was a college professor, I had a student who wanted to set up a meeting with me. She had some questions about the class. And I figured maybe it was some issue of interpretation. Maybe she had a question about a Bible passage. Maybe she had a question about the final paper or something like that. She came to my office and it became immediately apparent to me that her questions about the class were not about the assignments, were not about any details of the lecture. She said to me, Dr. Barber, I'm just having a hard time buying what you're selling. She said, you say that God loves me, but I've done some terrible things. God and I don't get along too well, she said. She broke down in tears right there in my office. And the more we started talking, the more it became apparent that she viewed God in a way that the New Testament never describes him. She viewed God as a sort of authoritarian father figure who has his arms folded up in heaven, who looks down, on his children and says, I'm not impressed. And I told her, God loves you just the way you are. She thought she needed to become worthy of God's love, but I had to tell her, God loves you precisely even as you are unworthy. You see this in the Gospels, right? In the Gospels, Jesus comes not only as the Savior, Jesus comes, as I like to explain to people, as the seeker. We read a beautiful story in Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. Now this is a big deal. Tax collectors in the ancient world were not well respected. Why? Well, because people don't like people, the government taking your money. Well, yeah, there's always that. But remember the tax collectors in many contexts were working with the Romans. The Romans were vile. They were barbaric. You can see this illustrated. There's a, a, a coin from the ancient world called the Judea Capta series. Uh, and you can see on the reverse side of some of these coins, an image of this woman who's weeping, 
who's terrified. There are different interpretations, but there's a Roman soldier looming over her. Many scholars believe that the scene is meant to depict the rape of a woman which would be completely consonant with Roman occupation of Judea. The soldiers brutalized the people in the land. You had no rights whatsoever. We become numb to this. We've seen so many passion plays where little kids are dressed up like Roman centurions. We forget that the Romans were nothing short of terrorists to ancient Israelites. They invaded their land, they pillaged their resources, and they persecuted them mercilessly. Zacchaeus is working with the Romans. He's a chief tax collector. He's despised among the people, not just for taking their money, but the, the tax collectors could charge whatever they wanted. They were not necessarily under any limitation on what they could charge you. They were bullies. Jesus says in Matthew 5, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. What happens in the story? Well, we read in Luke 19, he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not, and on account of the crowd, because he was small of stature, he couldn't see what was going on. He ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus. He's experiencing FOMO, fear of missing out, right? <laughs> what is everybody all excited about? He climbs up the tree, he wants to see what's going on, he sees Jesus. And he looked up, Jesus looks up into the tree and says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus invites himself over. So Zacchaeus made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is the Savior, but he's also the seeker. Zacchaeus isn't worthy. Jesus sits with the sinners. Jesus goes to the house of sinners. If you want a seat at Jesus' table, the first thing you have to do is recognize that you're a sinner. God doesn't give his grace simply to the worthy. He comes because he knows we are unworthy. This is the teaching of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Paragraph 2010, since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion. Now, yes, good works play a role. We'll talk about works and how they re relate to salvation. But let's be clear. God comes to us because salvation is not self-help. And if we forget that, we put a barrier between us and God. If we forget that, we won't rely on his grace. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we really believe that? Here's how you can know. How much time did you spend in prayer this morning? How much time do you spend in prayer during the day? If you can get through an entire day without prayer, you know what you just told God? I didn't need you. I have it covered. Salvation is only possible because of grace, because of God's gift, because of Jesus Christ, who empowers us to become like him, to become life-giving lovers like he is. Let's thank him for this gift and ask him to draw us more closely to himself so that we can become givers like Christ.